Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are tuning in from today. Thank you for, for joining us online at this very exciting Human Element session um, at the IMRS Annual Conference for 2022. Now, my name is Yvette uh, de Klerk. I'm tuning in from Singapore today. I'm Head of Training with Wallam Ship Management, um, and I'll be your host for today. So lovely to have you here. Um, before we get started, before I introduce the first speaker, um, I just want to also thank and acknowledge the Bangladesh Maritime Academy for sponsoring the session. Now, you can have a look on the exhibition area um, if you want to find out more about the Bangladesh Mar Maritime Academy as well. The format of today, we're going to have three presentations. I will introduce each speaker individually before they do their presentation. And at the end, we will have our Q&A session. So please, we look forward to receiving a lot of your questions. And um, we're using the slido.com app um, and you can use the has hashtag um, element. So without further ado, I am gonna introduce our first speaker, Martin, if you'd like to, to get up your, um, share your screen. So Martin Shaw, uh, Martin started a career at sea before moving ashore. He's had various leadership positions with the oil major following an MBA. Um, also included ship vetting, offshore products, <laughs> projects, um, fleet management, SMP, VP HSCC, and technical VP. Later also ran a consultancy um, firm and volunteered as IMRS, including the chair of the Human um, Element Working Group and is president-elect. Now, very importantly, um, and I'd like to articulate this, is Martin was also awarded the Merchant Navy Medal for meritorious service during 2020. Now, for those of you that don't know what this means, it's basically a state award within the British Honours System. It is awarded annually to no more than 20 recipients um, on Merchant Navy Day, which is normally the 3rd of September. So fantastic. And Martin, we look forward to listening to you and your presentation is touching on the sustainable solution to a titanic problem. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Yvette. I, I hope I can live up to that introduction. Uh, let me just um, start with the, the name of the, uh, the presentation, uh, A Sustainable Solution to a Titanic Problem. Uh, originally, it didn't have the question mark in it. I'll explain something of the, 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 the significance of the question mark later. Uh, as um, Yvette has, has mentioned, I'm, I'm president-elect of IMRS. Uh, in the normal course of things, I would um, I would may take over as, uh, as president in March of next year, but I've, I've been told that depends on my good behavior running up to that. So we'll see how I do on that one. Um, so I want to talk, talk about um, a project that, that uh, IMRS has been involved with, with an, an organization called the Human Element Industry Group. I will go through what, what that is towards the end of the presentation, um, but the outline of the presentation is a bit of a recap. I did do a similar presentation last year, um, but th things have moved on since then. Um, question, where does time pressure come from? There's a bit of uh, discussion about the customer and how the customers may generate time pressure. Ports and terminals, how the ports and terminals may generate um, pressure. There's a question in here about do, what defences are available for dealing with time pressure. Um, and um, and do those defences work? Finally, I'll talk about the Human Element Industry Group, and then hopefully come to some sort of a conclusion, which is always a always a good idea in a presentation. Uh, so let's start with the let's start with the Titanic. So nice picture of the Titanic. There's a lot of myths about the the, the, the Titanic and and um, time pressure. Um, any of you who saw the the famous 1997 97 documentary in the Titanic will remember there was a suggestion that they were trying to get the blue ribbon for the for the fastest crossing, and there was a suggestion that the uh, that the, um, uh, the 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 lookouts had been uh, distracted by Kate Winslet on the forecastle and various other things like that. Um, the, the true the true words from the inquiry are: the loss of the said ship was due to collision of an iceberg brought about by the excess speed at which the ship was being navigated. 110 years ago, this was a problem. Um, and the, the father went on to, to make this interesting statement, which effectively said, it wasn't really the captain's fault, but we hope in the future people will not do this again. Otherwise, we'd be considering it as negligence, which is rather rather soft um, sort of um, um, uh, instruction not to, not to go too fast. There, are, there have been many other examples of um, 
of time pressure, notable ones, Torrey Canyon, which grounded um, off the uh, southwest of, of England, um, caused one of the largest oil pollution incidents in that area. The Rena, which is uh, is relevant to uh, to New Zealand, was was cutting a corner to make a uh, to make an ETA. The Herald of Free Enterprise famously was um, left port with the bow doors open, um, with the intention of getting um, getting somewhere quickly. Um, and you know there are many different there are many different incidents. Um, that, that you can identify in this in collisions and groundings, moving cargo, maintenance and enclosed space incidents. So that, that's just a quick recap of why we're even talking about this. Um, and there's kind of an important point here. 110 years after the, the Titanic incident, we know time pressure is there, but we don't really know that it's been dealt with yet. Um, moving on, and this is a sort of um, a, a relatively common, a common picture, um, which which, which illustrates the fact that there is a balance between performance and protection, in other words, safety and cost. And if you don't find the right balance, if you, you concentrate too much on performance, you can have catastrophes. If you concentrate too much on um, protection, the company goes bust. And if the company goes bust, um, then it doesn't make the world a safer place. So that's a, an issue we have to deal with. Time pressure can come from um, from a, a legitimate authority, those in your, your chain, of chain of management above you, or it can come from yourself. Um, it can come from, from your senior management where they directly say to do something, you're told to do something, or it can be indirect or implicit. And that is, you've taken a signal from management that you want to really do something, they want you to do something, but it's not, it's not explicit. And then there's the self-induced bit, which is what people mostly point to. Um, and, and that is, something about somebody feeling that they, they, they need to do something for a, for a particular reason. Um, effective time, the, the effect of time pressure, it's been called fast and slow th thinking. Fast thinking is, is that situation you get into when you're in a rush to, to go somewhere in your car and you're running late um, and you start leaving behind all the good, the good ideas and good practice that you learned and start cutting corners and crashing lights and doing all sorts of stuff like that. And you can translate that into, into a, a, a shipping scenario quite quickly. Um, there is a thing called the efficiency thoroughness trade-off, which, uh, which means you don't do something as thoroughly uh, as you should do uh, because you want to get it done quickly. And that quite often results in ships leaving port without being fully prepared for sea. Um, container stacks fall over as a result of that. Uh, rescuer syndrome is, is a, um, a sort of idea that, um, that, that relates to enclosed spaces. And that is if you see somebody down an enclosed space, um, you immediately react and go down there to to uh, to rescue them without remembering the fact that there's a reason that they may be collapsed and um, we have multiple casualties in, in enclosed spaces um, for this reason. Uh, it leads to stress and fatigue and also it's important to say that there is a difference between time pressure and fatigue. Time pressure is specific to a task, operation or time, whereas fatigue is something cumulative. Um, where does it come from? Um, this is a big complicated drawing and a, a picture and I'm not going to use all of it, but, but we put together a picture in this working group um, of, um, of all the various sources of time pressure. And if you look at this, you, know, you start off with a, a charter where there are tight, tight deadlines um, and that runs through the various sort of departments um, to, to get to the ship's management team. There are a number of barriers that are put in place to stop that. Um, that time pressure getting through. Uh, one is a sort of risk assessment before chartering. The second one is the, the sort of risk assessments carried out by the technical department. The third one is the, the, the designated person ashore. Um, and then you have the master's um, authority in the middle of all of this. Um, and, um, you know, going through this in some detail, there are lots of different things. If you look at the black line there, the black line there, it is about um, uh, is about pressure which starts within the ship owner, where, where you might want to get ship, uh, ships out of dry dock more quickly, or or get them to um, expedite a repair or something like that. Uh, you've got all the things that happen in port. You've got all the things that happen in terminals, and you can see there are a massive number of, sort of barriers there uh, that are supposed to work, and we we have to question whether they're entirely effective in every case on board the ship. The, the management team can give instructions um, and you know, follow procedures. And, and there's a big chunk of this is, is also about safety culture. So that, that's a very quick run through that, uh, that picture. Um, the chain line that you see at the bottom there 
talks about um, about um, implicit time pressure, and that is things like KPIs, bonus, and performance management, which encourage people to do things um, do things quickly um, without explicitly saying so. Um, Efficiency is not a crime. Uh, I won't read this all out, but but you know the, the main the main point and oops the main point of all of this is if you've designed a, a ship and a system for a fast turnaround like LNG projects, ferries, container ships, and you've built it to do that and you operate it um, in the correct way, you train people um, to, to to manage it correctly. That's fine. That's okay. Excessive time pressure is when you're trying to to enforce that sort of um, uh, high tempo on a basic ship, maybe one that's not well, well, well maintained, a port that you visit randomly and not regularly. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different things there. So, you know, the point of this presentation is don't do things efficiently. It, it, sorry, the point is not to say you shouldn't do things efficiently. Um, let's talk about the customer. Um, let, let's remember that the customer starts with us. It starts with you and I. We want cheap products now. You know, we all want our, we all want our mobile phones. We all want our, 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 our laptops and our various other pieces of, of technology, uh, indeed our cars, uh, and we want them as quickly as possible. And that that's resulted in what I describe as the optimized supply chain. And we've seen the problems with that um, within the last couple of years. Um, first of all, with the Suez Canal grounding, and secondly, with the with the COVID stuff. Um, what you get is the long supply chains combined with globalization. Things are coming a long distance, um, and the customer is not keeping large stocks of reserves. So that means there's a lot of pressure on, on the ship's um, arrival times. My feeling is it's not going to get any better. And we also have to remember that um, shipping commercial law is, is about um, shipping commercial law is about um, excuse me that, rather stupid idea to use a timer that keeps shutting down. Um, Shipping commercial law is about uh, is about money. Regulation is about safety, and the two don't always um, always uh, fit together. Um, if you think about the, the, the what the customer wants, um, you know they want the ship to 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 arrive at a particular time. If you think about what we want, there are a number of risks that, that are faced by by trading a ship. There's the what risks. What is the ship going to carry? There's the where risks. Where is it going to go? And there's a when risk, and that is, is there enough sufficient time to navigate and to do everything safely and, 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 um, and, and all the rest of that. So that, that's a, a sort of thing that's worth giving some thought to. Ports and terminals, quite often, excuse me, there's limited storage. There are industry league tables that are encouraging um, ports to move more quickly. There's sometimes pressure to berth the vessel irrespective of the weather, iris irrespective of whether the ship is ready or not. Um, there's a thing called the facilitation convention, which is meant to deal with all of the um, all of the paperwork that comes aboard the ship through a, a single window in inverted commas, and and it should be dealt with um, at sea. Now that that convention has been in for many years, and many ports do not still use it. So when you arrive in port, one of your first duties is to repel boarders, um, and that could be statutory bodies who who have to be there and haven't. Um, participated in the single window approach, or it could be stevedores who, who have to be there um, to, to, uh, to unload the cargo. Um, there's an issue to do with stevedores contracting. In many parts of the world, stevedores contracting are, um, stevedores, stevedores are casual labor. Um, in other places, they're well-trained. Um, use the agent, make use of the agent because the agent can be, can be the, the captain's secretary and can control access to the ship. The only um, thing I've heard people say positive about, about COVID um, was um, that it kept an awful lot of casual visitors off, off ships. Um, so uh, if they didn't need to be there then, why do they need to be there now? Um, and finally, uh, ports encourage ships to sail in a sort of fire and forget way. Um, and they may encourage a ship to sail um, without all the appropriate um, stability uh, calculations done with all the lashings in place and, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, this is a picture of the voyage cycle. If you look at the right hand side, that's load, loaded voyage, which is which is uh, sort of high in environmental risk. If you look at the left side, that's high personal risk. The colouring doesn't imply any, uh, any sort of um, uh, signification of importance. But if you look at um, the cycle as it goes on, when the ship leaves, Potentially, you've got spaces on board the ship that may have trapped atmospheres that people are not thinking about. Um, 
There may be insufficient time to clean the cargo, which gives a risk to the crew. Uh, there may be pressure to meet the ETA, which could result in a risk, a risk of a navigation incident. There may be pressure to berth the vessel, which also um, results in a, a navigation incident. There may be a pressure to inspect, carry out surveys and, and, um, uh, and, and get into, the, into the, the tanks and holds. There may be pressure to unbirth, which is a risk to stability, cargo security, sea readiness. Um, and um, uh, you know, sailing with obviously a risk of uh, a navigation, a navigation accident if going too quickly. Uh, and then um, pressures to ETA again. So we just go sort of back through the same sort of cycle again. So there are many opportunities for time pressure to create um, a, a problem. Um, do the defences work is a big question. Uh, two different ships, the Herald of Free Enterprise in 1987, which led to the ISM code, the Hogasaka, which happened in 2015. Um, and if you look at these two incidents, you'll find that they are they're very similar, rapid turnaround, um, ship, ship not specifically designed for a port or loading orders changed, lack of clarity, clarity and responsibilities. Um, there were opportunities to, to, to produce technical solutions. There were indications that something was wrong to start with. And the only thing that separates these two um, ships is 20 years of ISM. And, and it would appear that 20 years of ISM um, hasn't uh, provided all the, um, uh, the, the solutions that we would hope it would. This is a, a sort of analysis that we've done. Um, I'm going to skip this a little bit. I realize I'm running a little bit, little bit low on time. Uh, but you can see what we've done is we've seen there, the barriers are the things in red. We've looked at where the barriers may be weak. And then we've looked at a number of solutions as to how things have been done. Um, moving on very quickly, uh, one of the things that we picked up in that analysis was organisational issues. Um, and if you think to the think back to um, the sort of traditional ship owner, everything was, was linear, everything was under one roof. Um, nowadays, there are many different ways that you can construct a shipping company. And, and we would argue that ISM has not been constructed to deal with all of those different um, organisational structures. Um, so taking that, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you look at that um, at some measure, but, but what we're saying is that, that the integrated model on, on the right-hand side of your screen um, is the traditional model and the one that ISM was designed to deal with. The one on the left, um, the, the technical manager is the person who is generally um, being audited, um, and the other bits of that, um, that, that puzzle are not necessarily um, being dealt with. Um, and the ship manager is in, in a difficult position um, for, for a variety of different reasons. One, one of them is that they don't directly control the budget um, and they may have somebody else who's making decisions about chartering who's not covered within the document of, of compliance. So there are a lot of issues to do with the way that shipping companies have evolved over the years um, to, uh, to, 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 uh, um, that, that have resulted in changes to ISM. And there is there are changes, there are amendments, there's a fundamental review of ISM likely to come up in the early part of next year, which is supposed to bring in the human element, which will be, which will be good news. Um, the master, um, who would be a captain today? Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy job. The master has in, in law the overriding authority. Um, on safety matters. He can say no to anything, he can say yes to anything. But the question is, is he the final protection or is he the only one? Are the people further up the chain, the chartering people, the ship, the, the uh, technical people, the DPA, are they just leaving it for the master to, to, to catch things or are they helping them? The master's authority in, in operational situations is clear that, and that's instantaneous. He has to do stuff in, in, the, in, the, in the moment as it were. Um, for um, planning and decision making generally to do with the, the, the cargo. Um, the master can be in the loop um, without any great difficulty. Um, and um, if the master is not in the loop, that's a reflection on the charterer, the owner, um, the safety management system and their safety culture. You know, the master is, is there as, a, as the, the goalkeeper in this situation. He's not the entire, he's not the entire team. Um, so last, uh, 34.1 says, any other person shall not prevent or restrict the master from taking any decision necessary for safety of well, life at sea. Um, does, that, does that 
does that work? I mean, can the master not be replaced by, by the, uh, the charter's request? And there are charter parties that, um, that, that allow that. So the question is, have we given the master all the support that we need to give him? Human Element Industry Group, um, very quickly on this one. Uh, we, th this was set up in 2018 at the request of the Secretary General of IMO, um, and it's about the human element. The membership is, um, is NGOs that are accredited to IM IMO. Uh, we can co-opt other people and we have flags, although with tongue in cheek, we, 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 did, we, we allow the flags to be members, uh, to be um, observers, not voting members. And then if you look at the um, uh, at who's there, it's a, a, a list of the great and the good um, in the safety in the safety side of IMO. Uh, you've got the Nautical Institute, you've got ourselves, ICS, ITF. You, you've seen all the initial how not go on. Um, the enclosed space project that led to this um, time pressure uh, time pressure work um, was initiated by Intermanager following a survey of five thousand seafarers. Um, enclosed space deaths are believed. Um, to be uh, the biggest occupational safety killer aboard ship. Um, and many investigations tend to blame the victim. So we set out to find out what's behind that. And those are the, the work streams that are involved in it. Um, the word abuse um, came up in the time pressure um, feedback where they believed that the, the amount of time pressure that was being uh, heaped on the seafarer uh, was equivalent to being abuse. Um, so we've got sort of 40 to 50 people from about 20 organizations um, on five continents have been working on this project. It's huge. And you'll be seeing you you've been seeing and you'll be seeing more from it as we start to deliver the, the outputs that, uh, as we come out of the investigation phase. Um, OK, final slide. Um, time pressure. It's not new. It's not been addressed. And I believe it's not getting better. What would be a sustainable solution? And I say. Uh, I say question mark on this one because we're, we've still not got all the answers. Uh, what would be good would be understood would be customers who understood the risks of putting time pressures on, on ships and built resilient supply chains rather than, than expecting um, the ship um, to rather than expecting the ship to, um, uh, to to carry the load. Ports who see themselves as part of shipping safety um, and also have reserve capacity. We've got regulations that manage time pressure and the other chartering risks. Owners and managers who don't test the master's authority. And the, and the big one in all of this is an industry safety culture. I don't believe the shipping industry has a safety culture. I believe components of it may aim towards a safety culture, but, but I don't believe that, that the industry as a whole has a consistent um, safety culture that includes charterers, owners, and the people aboard ship. Um, and um, and that's, that's me. Um, back to you, Yvette. Thank you very much for that, Martin. I hope you were not under too much time pressure to cover all of this in your allotted time, but you've done perfectly. Thank you for that. It makes my job much easier. If there was, um, it was self-induced time pressure. <laughs> Touche. But um, we, we're so lucky that these sessions are recorded that we can go back to it because there's, there's so much there that you've, that you've covered. Um, that one can go back and unpack again more. Um, and I hope when we get to the question and answer stage that some of this could perhaps um, give you some more opportunity to, to dive a bit deeper into those. Um, and then you mentioned the, the book by Daniel Kahneman, The Thinking Fast and Slow. I can definitely also, to the, to the audience and the listeners, definitely um, recommend that book as well. So thank you for that. Much appreciated, Martin. And we're not being offered money for, for promoting that book. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I wish we did. Anyway, um, Eric, if you want to, you can put on your your um, camera and share your screen. Now, Eric Holiday is joining us from New Zealand, and I believe it is quite late already and probably very cold because you're in winter. So thank you for, for joining us. Now, Eric is an IMRS fellow, chair of the Fisheries Special Interest Group. Um, and also the CEO of the Fish Safety Foundation. Now, the foundation is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and safety um, and also outcomes within commercial fishing. And as we all know, um, commercial fishing has been recognized as one of the most, probably the most hazardous um, working environment. Now, there's been a report some years ago, 2018, the Insight Report Safety in the Fishing Industry. 
And Eric's presentation is following on from that. Um, there's currently, it's funded by the Lloyd's Register Foundation in conjunction with Fish Safety Foundation. Um, and it's looking at the fishing safety roadmap. So we're getting a, a project update on that. Thank you, Eric, and over to you. Yvette, thanks very much. Thanks very much to Imarest. And just a quick note before I jump into this, uh, Martin, as always, uh, your, your, your talks are always really interesting. I have to say though, that in the fishing industry, uh, we're still not at the stage of talking too much about safety culture, too much about talking about ISM codes. Uh, it's fair to say we still have a way to go. So again, Yvette, thanks very much. Um, as you said in your introduction, um, what I want to talk about is, is just a project that we're busy with. Uh, it's funded by Lord's Register Foundation. And essentially, we're looking at a roadmap. And as, as Yvette said, this follows on from some earlier work we'd been doing with uh, the Lloyd's Register Foundation. And back in, uh, I think it was about March 2018, I think was the first meeting. I was asked to chair a meeting and, and we brought people from around the world and we sat down and, and we said, what are some of the big issues in fishing? We, I, I myself come from a maritime background. Um, many of the people there were maritime background, but, but fishing we know is different. There's, there's a different culture, there's, there's a different legislative framework, and we want to know where this fits in and, and what needs to be done. And the end result of that was this insight report. And I, you know, for anybody interested in, in, in fishing safety and, you know, fish uh, or safety in, in the world's most hazardous um, industry, Take a look, go on, uh, go online on, on Lloyd's Register Foundation, have a look at, at uh, this insight report. It's some really, really interesting stuff. You know, we, we, we found things like, um, you know, for the past 20 years, we've been using a figure of 24,000 fatalities per year in this industry. By comparison, Maritime, that, that Martin was talking about, um, has something like 300 fatalities. So we're looking at 24,000 fatalities per year. Um, but one of the things that, became really clear was that this figure is actually probably massively inaccurate and underrepresents what is what is really happening there. So that was a starting point for us. We started looking at um, why and, and how do fatalities occur? And, and clearly what we found um, was that in the developed world and the developing world, there were two totally different sets of, of reasons um, behind fatalities. In fact, when we looked at, at those, let's call it developed world, you know, those with, with relatively more favorable economic conditions, we found some interesting things like, um, and, and listen to the tone of this, poor enforcement of existing regulations, suboptimal vessel design, suboptimal technology, incomplete or suboptimal safety training, suboptimal emergency equipment, suboptimal work, uh, work culture. So there were elements of, of each of these um, available or things to be learned from but they weren't utilized fully and even in in, in our developed world in, in in the uk in europe in the nordic countries um out across the pond in in, in canada and the states um accident rates are really high you know certainly much higher than than land-based um occupations and then as we expected but we, we could confirm that in, in the, the countries with less financial means, um, much of the countries in, in, in Southern Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, some of the, some of the countries there, um, there was very little enforceable regulation. Uh, the, the boats were small, seaworthy, often very dangerous, often had to go out very far. Um, collisions were, were, were rampant, um, given the number and lack of lights and, and, and you know, uh, that type of thing lack of weather information. Um, and the final point there is, is probably the most important one. Fishers in many of those countries have very little choice as to when to fish. This is what they do. They have to go out, they have to feed their families. And we saw that in some of the countries um, that we worked on through the COVID pandemic. Countries like Bangladesh, and, and again, thank you for, for the sponsorship from from, from the maritime school there. But we, we saw in Bangladesh, these, these fishers, subsistence fishers had no choice. 
but to go fishing. So if you look at the numbers involved, and the numbers are always um, interesting in, in, in the whole fishing sector, things like, and I'll, I'll just bring a whole selection of them, 10 to 12% of the world's population is directly, indirectly depend on fisheries. Uh, 40 million, maybe 60 million, we don't know, there's, there's massive discrepancies in the numbers, uh, are directly engaged in capture fishes, the fisheries. More than 90% of those in the small scale fishing sector. Uh, 17 of 17% uh, of the world's um, animal protein is from fish. And in, in some countries, 70% of the animal protein that they eat is from fish. Um, per capita consumption of fish globally has gone up in the last 60 years uh, from, from, you know, it's, it's doubled in the last 60 years. Um, there's something like 4.6 million fishing vessels, 3.5 of those in Asia. Uh, if you look at the engine powered one, and obviously this is increasing as, as, as you know, um, as, as things change, something nearly 3 million are, are engine powered. 82% of, of those motorized vessels are 12 meters or less. And again, that ties up with our, our small scale fishing predominance there. Um, and only 1.5% of them are, are 24 meters or, or larger. And I'll, I'll talk about that very soon, about why that's a significant figure and number. Um, and then what we know very little of is things like injuries and illnesses and fatalities and vessel losses. In fact, when you start looking at those numbers, um, this is where it becomes really, really interesting. Um, I said right in the beginning in, in the inside report, we used the figure of 24,000 deaths. That's a figure that it sounds terrible. It comes from the last century, it comes from, from, from the late 90s, where there was a rate um, calculated of 80 per 100,000 fatalities. Just to give you some idea, your normal occupations, uh, shore side would be for maybe even less than that per 100,000. So even this figure back in, in 99 was, was exceedingly high. The FAO um, increased that, that estimate of fatality numbers now, uh, given that there's so many more um, uh, fishes out there. And our own research um, through the Fish Safety Foundation suggested this figure is actually three to four times higher. Um, that's what's commonly believed. We're working with Pew Charitable Trusts, and we've, we've undertaken a really in-depth study into trying to find a better number, a more representative number of fishing fatalities. And sadly, um, the number would suggest and, and you know, it clearly seems to be more than 100,000 plus uh, fatalities a year. So when you look at, at the price of fish, the human cost of fish, think about those 100,000 people that die every year, every single year, just to, to catch fish for us. And then, of course, there's the career-ending injuries, which are, which are often massive, lost arms, legs, eyes, that type of thing. And then the other side in, in our research um, pulled out this, this whole issue of occupational health. And we know cancers among fishes and, and seafarers are much higher than shore-based activities, musculoskeletal disorders, suicides are high, drug and alcohol addictions, and all types of, of disorders along the way. So why is this like this and, and how does it compare? Um, I guess it's, it, it, it's worth looking at. So if we look at, at the maritime sector, the commercial maritime sector, the sector that I started off as, as, as a youngster going to see, um, there's about 1.6 million seafarers by, by most estimates out there. Uh, there's something like the, the figure that we have there is, is less than 300 fatalities per year. And what that means, even though it's, it's sad, it means that less than one person per day um, in, in the merchant marine fleet succumbs to, to, uh, to accidents. If you look at, along the bottom there, you'll see that there's a really strong legislative framework. I think Martin touched on that. He said, there's a ton of legislation out there, whether it's always applied is, is something else, but there's a lot of legislation in the maritime industry. If we compare that to the fishing industry, let's look at 60 million and, you know, fishes out there. Let's look at 100,000 plus fatalities per year, um, which means we're looking at something like 275, give or take, every single day. So every single day, there's, there's 275 um, on average fishes that are killed out there. Um, it's, it's an incredibly difficult number to, 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 to get your head around. 
until you start looking at the research and you start reading the reports. And then at the bottom of, of, of this picture, again, um, there's a representation of, of the legislative framework and it shows the gaps, the pieces of the puzzle that are missing. And we're really working hard to, to, to get more countries, to get more nations to sign up for things like the Cape Town Agreement, for the ILO Working Fishing Convention, for the FAO PSMA uh, type conventions, uh, SDCW fishing, there's, there's still a massive amount that needs to be done. Um, and I'll show you in our work with, with our roadmap work, how important legislation is. And then there's a whole bunch of other issues, safe to vessel, IUU fishing, sustainability compliance, anything from pollution and gas gear and plastics, overfishing, work conditions, everything else. And, and you know, th this, uh, this session that, we, that we're looking at today is all about the human element. And ultimately, our fishers out there are the greatest users of the sea, of the oceans. And, and I always brought back in, in New Zealand, in my adopted current country in New Zealand, uh, we have a saying, a local Maori saying, and I'll read in English. It says, what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. In, in, in Maori, the last part is hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata. So whatever work we do, we, we've got to remember that it's all about the people. It's all about the people in fishing. So coming back to, to, to our work, we've been working with, with Lloyd's Register Foundation for a while. And last year, um, Richard Clegg, who was the CEO, who's just retired. And Richard, if you're listening to this, we, we wish you all the best with, with your retirement. Um, Richard uh, challenged us to have a look and see if we can design a roadmap going forward. And he left it at that. He said, go out there and, and see what you can do. And, and we then looked at, at this project and we wondered how we would do that. And we looked at four parts of that, four part uh, strategy. We got a group together and we started looking at what uh, projects are currently underway in the world, in fishing safety, right across the world, in, in developed parts, in, in, in developing worlds, in small scale fishing, in large scale commercial fishing, what's currently being done. From that, we're busy working out and, and going really well at the moment, what still needs to be done, identifying that very clearly, then trying to identify which organizations should take the leading role with that. Are they nonprofits like ourselves? Are they UN agencies like the FAO, <clears throat> IMO, ILO, whoever? Is it commercial industry, uh, the, the uh, satellite um, connectivity uh, organizations? Who should take part of it? And then fourthly, because there's a totally, totally different dynamic, commercial dynamic in, in, in fishing, who would fund these initiatives? Especially, again, going back to the fact that 95% of the world's um, fishers are in developing parts of the world and they're small scale fishers. It needs to be externally funded. It's not like <clears throat> commercial maritime, which has a totally different uh, cost structure. So that's what we, we started looking at. And we, 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 we're working towards this roadmap. So to, to put some structure around that, we decided we needed to start off with, with a conceptual framework. And we took the old chestnut out, you know, the three E's, engineering, enforcement, and education, and we added evidence and we added environment. And this is what we come up with. We said we need to look at, at what engineering is currently taking place and still needs to be done. And that could be things like design, technology, innovation. We looked at enforcement, which is our legislative framework and, and governance. We looked at education, which includes things like training and engagement and empowerment. And then we looked at, at because it's a risk-based approach that, that's needed, we needed to do research, uh, we needed to look at data, and then we had to do this whole thing within this conceptual framework of, of, of the environment. And I'll explain shortly what we mean. That goes beyond just the weather. Um, so that's where we're at. So risk-based, and again, this prompted us to, to have a look at risk controls and, and clearly if, if, if you look at risk management and you look at risk controls, we, we are told again and again that engineering controls, enforcement controls, uh, policy controls um, are stronger than people controls. So we just bear that in mind. And unfortunately, the education one is, is the people control 
Um, and that's where we've put most of our money and our time and effort, and quite possibly that isn't enough. So we, we looked at this from, if, if we build our model on, on, on you know, based on solid evidence, uh, we get that engineering, uh, enforcement and, and education pillars. Our goal is a safe and sustainable uh, fishing, you know, globally. We know that in the real world, these things are all you know, tied up and, and, and interact with each other. But for the beginning of our project, we, we kept them separate. We then also looked at how effective they currently are. And this was where we started, had to make some real basic assumptions. So we looked at engineering. We broke it down into three different things. <clears throat> and we looked at things like technical standards. And actually, there, there's a lot of technical standards out there um, in voluntary guidelines, in all types of things. When, when it comes to the safety of the vessel being built, and remember, this is a developing world small-scale fishing as well. Uh, the percentage there was much lower. Things like connectivity and communication abilities was, was massively low. So we came up with an arbitrary figure of 30% in, in the engineering side. Enforcement, roughly the same type of thing. There is a legislative framework. It's not excellent, but it's there. It can be built on. But the actual governance, the actual application and the checks and balances at international and local level was significantly, significantly lower. So we came up with 25% there. And education, in terms of practical information, there's some really good stuff out there. The training activities and the awareness creation of that is, again, something else. So we came up with these, with these figures of, of, you know, the, the current level um, at, at 2022 levels um, is is 30 percent 25 percent and 50 percent and and we're not particularly interested in whether that's exactly right in terms of we wanted a representation so the base needs to be clearly built on we needed to look at a target we took um an arbitrary goal again with within our group of the next 20 years and if we can get each of these 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 pillars up to 75 efficiency and application then we're doing pretty well that's our target. So our roadmap becomes a 20-year uh, project trying to get all three of those uh, pillars up to uh, 75 application. So just really just for, for, for the background, what do we mean by enforcement? Well, we, we're looking at the legal framework. And as I said, there's actually quite a lot. But there's 40 to 50 or 60 million fishes out there. And the bulk of them are, are small scale and artisanal fishes and things like the Cape Town Agreement um, doesn't apply to them. Uh, things like voluntary codes, um, they will never have to apply and probably never even heard of. STCW fishing convention again is for 24 meters and above. So all of a sudden our, our, our numbers and complexity of our, of our legal framework um, start showing some massive holes in that. There is a really good convention out there. Um, you can see right at the bottom, when I, when I look under, under fishers, work in fishing convention from the ILO. But again, how do we apply that? So as I said, there, there is legislation, there is a framework, there's, there's mandatory, there's, there's voluntary, and a number of these mandatory ones haven't been signed up, up to yet, haven't been ratified. So there are issues certainly out there. There are technical standards, you know, um, if, if we look at the conventions, if we look at the ratifications, we can look at those as a minimum legal standard. Um, and then all this shows over years that the market to work on is really big. There's something like 400,000 fishing vessels of, of uh, 12 meters and above. And if you compare that to the merchant shipping fleet, whether it's 56,000 as, as shown here or 80,000, um, it, it doesn't really matter. There's, there's, all I'm trying to represent there very quickly is that there are that there's a really big market to, to work on. So does that mean that the classification societies, for instance, should be getting involved and should be getting interested here? Or is it does that sit with the PI clubs? Um, some of the PI clubs have been doing some really good work in fishing. Um, Sunderland does some really good work. North has been putting out some good posters. As I said, as a, a fish safety foundation, we're working with ship owners on some initiatives. Um, so in, in terms of the uh, enforcement, the legislative, the governance picture, 
there's a lot that's in place, there's a lot to be done, and there are some massive gaps out there. If we look at just very briefly the second pillar, looking at engineering, and I spoke about innovation and technology and all types of things, certainly from, from our work, um, the piece that's, that could make a massive difference in safety for, for the bulk of the world's fish and fishes is connectivity, um, but it's expensive. We, we accept it for granted. Uh, we take it for granted in, 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 the, in the commercial maritime industry and our large fishing boats and vessels are connected that people now, you know, be able to use this in probably 4 million of the world's fishing boats. There simply aren't, there isn't connectivity beyond the cell phone or sometimes a VHF radio. So there's, you know, so the, the group is looking at different things. It's something like this, a fad is something that, that's anchored to the, to, you know, often anchored to, to the ocean floor that fish, agri uh, uh, fish meet around and, and people fish around there. And, you know, maybe it's, it's cell phone um, repeater stations that's tied onto fads. It's just an idea of looking at, at technology and how to use it. It could be vessel design on the larger vessels. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's the ability to design for safety. The, the top left-hand picture over there is our friends at, at Yamaha from Japan. Um, who get involved in, in building and designing vessels, you know, safer fishing vessels. So maybe it's that. Or it could be um, one of our group members um, from Scotland um, has a um, stability management uh, program that he can put on vessels, knowing that, especially in the UK and, and some of the other Western countries, developed countries, a large cause of fatalities is, is uh, vessels um, being caught out and, and, and capsizing in terms of stability. And then there's, you know, life-saving equipment and variables. The one on the left is incredibly interesting. It's, it's, it's a life cell. It's an Australian product um, that is a, 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 float, a, a flotation device with pockets for, for putting your, your, your gear in to keep it safe and dry. And this is an extension to that uh, paid for uh, by, by Australia to, to work in Papua New Guinea. And year uh, Lifestyle expanded their, their thing to include a fish storage f facility and it's a seat on the boat. So if the boat sinks, this thing floats off and they, they've got all this stuff. Then, of course, the, the third important pillar is, is education. And certainly from the foundation's point of view, I'll put our plug in here, we do a hell of a lot of that. And it's critically important when we combine it with with engineering and enforcement. So we, we did some work in the Caribbean. Um, we're working with fishers. You can see the top left and, and picture there. We're working fishers and they asked us to, to take a standard uh, food and agriculture organization, FAO book, and, and make it for Caribbean. We did a whole suite of online training, anything from safety risk management to rules of the road to personal safety and, and survival at sea and emergency first aid and all types of things. And then set this up as, as resources uh, for, for, for trainers. And they can then grab and, and take in as, as they need it. With training comes safety uh, promotion and awareness creation. And this is, I spoke earlier about our work in Bangladesh. Uh, bottom, a few pictures in the, in, in, in the bottom there talking about um, how we promote um, on the ground in, in Bangladesh. So it's, it's critical that you promote your work as well, that you create awareness of training. I spoke about this all taking place within an environment, and that's clearly important. And, and this is from some of the other work we do. And all I want to paint, uh, pull out from you is that things like IUU fishing, weak governance, uh, sustainability issues, climate change, economic displacement, all interact with each other and, and make the fishing safety uh, picture much more complicated and much more difficult. And then when you start adding things like safety culture, as, as I said in the beginning to, to, you know, on Martin's presentation, safety culture, human factors in fishing, absolutely missing. Uh, safety management systems, absolutely missing for much of the world. Uh, different departments having different responsibilities, search and, and rescue facilities, corruption, all, all types of things. So some, some real issues in fishing. And then finally, in terms of, of evidence, the need for data, 
it's 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 something that FAO started looking at at at, at a while back, uh, looking for real data, and so we can base you know our interventions on evidence. And this is where the Fish Safety Foundations come in, and we we have what we call the Fisher Project, which is the first and only totally independent um, and global uh, accident database um, for for fishing, um, similar to I guess the IMSA. Such a, 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 a MSA, uh, database from from EMSA. Um, so we, we're busy working with that. And then, as a final thing for the fishers and for our participants in in uh, the roadmap group, we have an online safety resource where we put in as as much information as as we can. This will be a free to use front facing, um, and eventually everybody in the industry will be able to just pull off information from that. Um, just sharing is, is is spreading the message so i'll leave you with an invitation we started off with with something like like 18 invitees and 13 attendees at the end of last year we now currently have a, a, a mailing list of of 130 if you want to get involved in in working with us on this roadmap we would absolutely welcome that please contact us at any time um the invitation is out there we would we would absolutely be pleased to, to to work with you on this so that is a really quick overview of of what our project is all about um thanks very much if i'll return it to you thank you thank you eric again another fascinating presentation and again 20 minutes is never enough <laughs> once you get into a topic i mean the human element you can't limit the human element um but fascinating and taking the systems i'm going to call it a systems approach um, looking at these, the five E's, and of course, the, especially, I mean, for me, always in training, in terms of the education and the importance thereof, because the education is going to inform the policymakers, the legislation, the enforcement. It is such an important element. So thank you for that. Um, before I introduce our, our last, but certainly not the least speaker, um, I want to please remind you in the audience of the questions, so you can use the slido.com and using the hashtag element. Um, I'm following the questions on my phone, and I, I see we've already got some questions coming in, so please keep them coming in. Now, Jennifer, let me introduce you, and you've got another stellar background. So Jennifer has extensive experience in project coordination and relationship management of multidisciplinary personnel, clients, and subcontractors within the renewable sector. In her current role as the project management officer at Vattenfall, and for those that you don't know, that is Swedish for waterfall. I hope I pronounced it okay. Yes, you um, did. But with this company, acts as the functional lead for the PMO team um, within the product line department, also supporting the delivery of product products, projects, the wider alignment to support functions and asset projects. Yeah. Also contributes to the continuous improvement and development of the offshore PMO department. Also, as a member of the OWSD, and for those of you that don't know what that stands for, that is the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. That in itself sounds very interesting. Um, so within, as a member of this, um, within the People and Skills, Gender and Ethnicity Workstream, Energy Institute and Women in Energy Expert Platform, and the Renewable UK Future Leader 2021, Deputy Chair of the Technical Leadership Board, and a committee member of the Offshore Renewable Special Interest Group of IMRS. She takes an active role in helping to advance the energy sector in mentoring, public speaking, producing best practice guidance, um, and also contributing to consultations. So Jennifer, over to you. We are excited to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening uh, for those joining this session. I'm really pleased and honored to be uh, presenting today a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, so looking at the approaches to developing and nurturing a diverse energy workforce. So with the rapid growth of our marine sector, uh, especially in marine renewables, uh, this gives us a wonderful opportunity to grow the talent pool while also considering how to do it in a diverse, uh, equal and inclusive way. 
Um, and this is important so that the whole of society can be representative and contribute to a prosperous and sustainable future. In this presentation, I will focus on the UK offshore wind sector um, and look at what the current workforce looks like, what the future workforce needs to look like, um, why it is important to consider diversity, equality and inclusion when we develop our teams. Also, what best practice has been identified when it comes to recruiting and retaining talent, um, why we need to prioritise nurturing the future talent pipeline and also how we as an institute can rise to the challenge. Exciting times, a lot to cover and uh, I hope I can do it in the time that we have. So looking at our marine energy workforce, when we think of marine energy, it's perhaps we shouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion it's just offshore wind. Uh, it also includes um, energy generation from wave power, tidal power, tidal stream, tidal lagoons, uh, also uh, energy generated from temperature and salinity gradients. But interestingly, more technologies are being developed. And I read recently about algae being used to generate biofuel, which is very interesting. So we expect growth in these new novel areas as well. And those are the different areas of marine renewables. But when we look at roles that are included, it's not just engineers, scientists and technologists, uh, which encompass, which are involved in this sector, but also other specialisms uh, because it takes a lot of us to make marine renewables happen. Um, these can include those that work in IT, um, and that's critical to help us with our move towards digitization. Uh, very interestingly, we had this, this was already covered, I think it was yesterday in the session. Also important to consider those working in HR, um, and they keep our workforce well supported and also empowered so that we can deliver our jobs and roles in a, in a really fulfilled way. And I could go on, but there are many more, such as legal and procurement and commercial, uh, health and safety, stakeholder engagement and operational and project management roles as well. So all diverse talent, diverse skills. Um, and yeah, this is, this is super critical. But looking particularly in the UK offshore wind sector, um, the uh, Offshore Wind Industry Council recently published the Skills Intelligence Report which showcased that um, in, in the last 12 months, the, India, the number of jobs has grown from, uh, has increased by 16% from 26,000 to over 31,000 people working in offshore wind. Uh, this is exciting, super exciting. And this is just UK offshore wind. If we look at growth in other renewables across uh, globally, um, the International Renewable Energy Agency in their Renewable Energy and Jobs 2021 annual review estimated about 12 million people are working in renewables directly or indirectly, and that was just in 2020. I'm sure these figures are, are much updated by now, but it just shows the, the extent of growth that's happening. But what is driving this growth and this demand for talent in the sector? Well, many governments have prioritised renewable energy development not only to reduce emissions and meet their international climate goals, but also to pursue broader socio-economic benefits. Um, uh, at a sort of global level, we can look at this as a part of the sustainable development goals, especially number goal number seven, which is clean energy. So the effort to ensure access to affordable, reliable and sustainable modern energy for all. And then also under the Paris Agreement, uh, within the EU, we have the European Green Deal, and um, there are many, many more initiatives, policies, targets, and goals, uh, which helps, which are in the process of being implemented. And this requires a collaborative and a creative workforce so that we can deliver them. Just touching on a few more, we also have the UN Ocean Decade, which aims to achieve the ocean we want by 2030. Uh, we are very honoured that we have uh, Dr. Steve, Professor Stephen Domora, who is our um, Amaris ambassador. And the vision here is to develop a multi-sector, multidisciplinary approach so that we can get the scientific knowledge and build infrastructure and foster relationships for a sustainable and healthy ocean for our global community. I know lots of IMRS members attended the, the conference recently. Thank you for those representing and um, taking part in this. We also have the Net Zero Coalition, 
So this is made up of countries and cities and businesses and other institutions that are pledging to be net zero. Uh, it has been calculated that our energy sector generates about three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions today. Um, so we really need to be the drivers and make the change to, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And as an industry and as a sector and as a talent pool, that's something that we need to do. Lastly, but no, mind, no means least, and I'm sure there are many more initiatives, is uh, decarbonisation. So this is part of our green industrial revolution to reduce emissions and create new low carbon markets in a super competitive way. So all these initiatives require uh, a need to, to expand the personnel working in the sector and also use their skills in different areas of the world so that we can generate a, well, create a renewable energy workforce to meet our global objectives. Um, going back to UK offshore wind, uh, UK, uh, the U uh, Renewable UK Energy Pulse database, um, they also, Renewable UK use the Energy Pulse database and also a forecasting model and an extrapolated pipeline of uh, prospective projects and future projects and also consider assumptions of growth and investment. They calculated that we probably need about 97,000 employees um, by 2030, um, of which 61,000 are direct and 36,000 are indirect. So we're looking to increase our workforce in the UK in offshore wind by 16.1%. Uh, this, this is a massive growth, especially how long have we got? Eight years, eight years to grow our sector. I'm sure uh, we're doing, we're making great strides to get there, uh, but many more needs to be done. Uh, but looking on a continental level, the European Commission strategy is also looking at the potential of offshore renewable energy. And they have identified that marine renewables need to scale up by five times and by 25 times by 2050 to support the Green Deal's objectives. Okay, so where was I? 20,000, uh, we have a shortfall of 20,000 uh, graduates. Um, and so in spite of this, we can use this as an opportunity to have a... Um, uh, to recruit and enrol new talent, uh, considering diversity, but also not just considering prior attainment. So another thing to consider is that 20% of our energy and utilities workforce are due to retire within 10 years. Um, and in order to replace them, we also need an additional 221,000 recruits, um, which, which is notable. Um, and looking at the graph on the right hand side, we also need to consider the peak workload as a result of numerous consents and award, uh, leases being awarded. So this is prior to this is not considering you know, projects that are already uh, being commissioned and operational. We also need to plan for the future going forward. Um, now that wind farms are having a design life of 35 years and beyond, you have basically got a job for life. But we also need personnel to be able to develop these projects and construct them. Um, but again, as said before, with the opportunity for growth comes the opportunity to consider how we can do this in a, in a really sustainable and effective way. So um, let's look at diversity, equality and inclusion when we build our teams. But what do we mean when we talk about diversity, equality and inclusion? So equality um, is a state of being equal, especially in status rights and opportunities. Uh, diversity is a range of many people or things that are different from each other and inclusion is included or being included within a group or structure. Um, within Vattenfall we have this wheel which we refer to it very fondly which kind of captures what diversity means and it's looking beyond the typical inclusion of women or those with um, different sexual orientations. It's also those who are neurodiverse to us or with different backgrounds or cultures or ethnicities. And, and it just kind of opens our eyes a little bit more on what diversity really means. Um, and this is critical to consider when we look at our hiring process, uh, we must consider all dimensions, especially differently able uh, personnel and those with neurodiverse characteristics. Um, interestingly, diverse teams have been proven to be more innovative because they have diverse perspectives and the experience of each participant is different, which creates and stimulates creative ideas. Um, but also with varied experience comes varied knowledge, not only with technical aspects, but also varied knowledge when it comes to market 
knowledge and supply chains and stakeholders and customers. And as renewables, uh, marine renewables is a global thing. This is, this is super critical and uh, can help us also have cultural insights. As a result, teams are much better prepared to position themselves to be competitive. One second. <laughs> It's just finding games this presentation um, to be uh, competitive, but also um, be more receptive to their target audience. Uh, we also have uh, individual sets of skills. And when we pull them together, such as the case in diverse teams, we can be more resilient and be better prepared to face complex managerial, technical and commercial challenges. Um, a notable attribute of these type of teams, diverse teams, is an increase in productivity. So this also leads to an increase in performance and an increase in profitability. Uh, because we've got different perspectives and points of view, we're able to sense check our ideas, our proposals, our strategies, and as a result, we're better at decision making. Um, and this is backed by a strong business case. Um, where a recent McKinsey report said that the top quartile for ethnic and cultural, um, that companies uh, uh, were in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity outperformed those in the fourth quarter by 36%, and the gender equivalent is 25%. But the process is not easy as we have to challenge our conscious and subconscious bias and prejudices and negative cultural stereotypes. Um, so that we can bring together different working styles and etiquettes. So, but adopting this in recruitment uh, requires a culture change and uh, a consequent update to the policies and processes that we work for. Hey. Oh. Um, and many companies and organizations are doing this internally and they've made great strides. I know within Vattenfall, we have a diverse energy network uh, where we come together and share best practice and address what needs to happen, not only within the UK, but in our other core markets. Uh, at, industry uh, at industry level, we have a new e equity, diversity and inclusion task force, which has been launched by Energy UK, Ofgem and the ENA, which brings together um, industry experts from various industry groups, such as Pride and Energy and Powerful Women, um, to share and exchange ideas on how to improve diversity. Um, They've just recently launched, and I think they're looking for new participants going forward. So very exciting and definitely a space to watch. Um, but again, it's critical that we present, represent all our upbringings and cultures in our workforce and, uh, show, and showcase diverse role models so that those that are interested uh, in entering the sector see people from similar backgrounds and see that they are thriving and that they are well supported. I am conscious of time, uh, but we will carry on. So uh, the offshore wind sector um, deal uh, has a people and skills work stream. And within that, there is a gender and ethnicity group of which I'm a part of. And um, we are working together to make sure that we meet the diversity and inclusion commitments set by, which have been set by government, where we need 33% of women to make up the workforce by 2030, with an ambition to reach 40%, and also um, calculate a BAME figure for representation. So when we think of BAME, we think of Black, Asian, and minority ethnic. But now we want to sort of move away from that terminology and um, just refer to it as uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic diversity. So uh, we need to increase this to 9% up from 5%, but hopefully we can reach 12% there. Um, but yes, that's that. Um, but this will require investment, um, which has been estimated at around uh, 10.1 billion uh, between now and 2026. And that's for the forthcoming allocation rounds um, for all the projects that are coming up. And uh, with that, we can definitely have some money to invest in our talent pool. Um, looking at best practice in adopting diversity inclusion and equality, we have developed, um, the, the working group has developed a best practice guide. Um, and this basically covers what can we do 
to promote DNI in the sector, and it covers all kinds of topics. And I really recommend it. It's a really great read for those who want to roll it out within their organisations. It includes how to um, consider attraction, recruitment, retention, progression, and it covers some case studies, checklists, guides, and frequently asked questions. Um, this has been shared throughout the sector with networks and supply chain, um, and. A critical thing to make it work is you manage what you monitor. So we're asking companies to help to start monitoring their data and their recruitment so that we can see where we're improving and what work needs to be done going forward. Um, we, I think they've published a, another one recently. I'm on maternity leave, so I'm a bit behind here. Um, and uh, there's also a plan to develop a guide on recruitment for diversity. Within Butterfall, we also have... Um, We've used this guide to uh, look at our hiring process and what it means and how we can use it to diverse um, to recruit diverse talent. So um, uh, there are many individuals with Asperger's skills uh, who are unemployed, but they have some a unique set of skills which are extremely valuable. Uh, their attention to detail, etc., which is definitely super beneficial in different areas of the business. Um, and we have since recruited. Um, using this kind of approach. Um, and we do recommend that going forward. Another thing that we have used is a machine learning tool to remove any gender bias vocabulary from job, job adverts. And we're also considering blind applications and how to support the applications of underrepresented groups to apply for roles. Um, but that's looking at those entering the sector uh, who are coming from different sectors, but we also need to inspire students and young people into renewables and attract them uh, for, from those transitioning from other sectors. Um, and to do this, it all comes to outreach and training. Um, and this will be critical so that we have people at the right time to meet our industry goals. Um, so we should work with education providers to keep them up to date with new innovations and skills. Um, so that they can hit the ground running as we have much to do. Um, and uh, within um, ORSIG, the Offshore Renewable Special Interest Group, um, talking to Alice, the co-chair, we I asked her and I said, Alice, what, what do you think? What is your perspective? And one of the key things she said is working with um, the Marine Learning Alliance um, so that we can make sure that uh, the skills and the topics that we teach are relevant um, and up to date. There's also, um, we also need to make sure that we don't have a leaky pipeline. So um, the women that sort of enter the sector leave due to personal or family reasons, and we don't want to lose that talent and we want to support them so that they stay within the sector going forward. And to do that, we need uh, wonderful policies with regards to wellbeing and work-life balance. And thank you to IMRS for helping me present here while I'm on that leave, which is a critical example of how we can make these things work. So what can we do in IMRS? Well, we should, um, I would encourage you to provide feedback on diversity and inclusion in your workplace. Uh, definitely respond to survey requests so that we can monitor growth um, and uh, encourage others to, to do as well. Also offer yourself as a, a case study or a role model um, so that people can see your career journey and see that it is possible. And also um, share any apprenticeship, apprenticeships or work experience or entry roles um, so that we can help support our graduates entering the sector. Um, and I know that we are doing this as a part of the accreditation of uh, courses and programs, but making sure that our education providers develop uh, study programs um, so that they are relevant and that when they enter the sector, they can hit the ground running. So in summary, after much theatricalness, um, we have got rapid growth in our sector and a major skills shortage. Um, but in spite of that, this is an opportunity to grow the, uh, the industry and uh, adopt a diverse workforce because diversity is good for business, it's good for communities, it's good for society. Um, but in addition to retaining talent, we also need to uh, nurture the future pipeline and make sure that they're aware of opportunities and um, know that they are welcome within our sector. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and I hand over to you, Yvette. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I think this is the, the perfect human touch to a human element discussion <laughs> because this is live in 2022. We, we're talking about how do we recruit 
train, retain the next generation, generation alpha, maybe even generation beta, I'm not sure, on the way. Um, the, the importance in terms of the diversity, the inclusion, equality. So thank you for all of these elements you've touched on. Thank you very much. I would like to invite the fellow speakers to also switch your cameras back on. Um, we cautious of time, but um, we've got quite a few questions we'd, we'd like to, to try and run through. So I'll go through the questions. Um, if you can try to keep your response concise, if possible. Also, if we don't get to address all of the questions um, afterwards, outside of this, we can, of course, respond per email if there are particular questions, um, unfortunately, that we're probably not going to be able to get to. So without further ado, um, let me have a look. The first one is for you, Jennifer. Um, role models are very effective, and you are definitely one, as we can all <laughs> agree for multitasking. Um, how would you suggest people share their stories? What instantly comes to mind is, and I'm as we have the See Your Future initiative and reaching out to the group there. We have some case studies uh, on our website, but also there are various um, networks such as Women in Sustainability, Entrepreneurial Women in Renewable Energy. There's the Global Network for Women in the Energy Transition. They're looking for mentoring um, and just I'm just putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and saying, like, this is where I've got to and how. Um, but uh, perhaps Yvette and Emily, we can post a link to those uh, in the session to see where they can do it from an IMRS perspective. But there are multiple initiatives and it's just offering help to say that I can, I can be that role model. And I promise you it will be super well received. Fantastic. Fantastic for that. Thank you, Jennifer. Martin, I've got a question for you. Um, extremely interesting presentation. Thank you. In terms of rules and regulations, what top three changes would you wish were introduced immediately? Well, I have to stop at three. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you, can, six. you can go to 300 on your <laughs> email response, but for now, <laughs> three. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, I think the, the, a lot of the things that we found about time pressure um, are relate to um, the risks that are created by trading a ship. Um, so when a when a when when a ship is chartered to, to do a voyage, um, there's uh, three, three types of risks. There's, what's the cargo? Is the ship fit to carry it? Where is it going? Is the, is the, is the port safe? Um, and is there time enough enough to do things? And those those things are pretty general. Um, and the defences for both of, for all three of those things are much the same. So. One of the things is um, is the master's authority. There's an awful lot left to the master. Uh, it's almost written into into law that if the master says no, that's okay. If the company says no, the, there are different sort of uh, reactions to it. So if the master um, the master has the right to say no, but written into regulations, there is a very limited um, body of regulation that supports that. There's there's a a, a one liner in ISM. There's a one liner in SOLAS. Um, but the master has to deal with a massive number of, of, of different issues. So some more clarity about the master's authority um, and, and the likes of that would be one area that could be, uh, that could be, could be worked on. Um, as I mentioned, um, a lot of the risks that's created in operating a ship comes from trading that ship from car the carriage of cargos. Um, over, over a period of time, the ISM code has evolved so that it's looking mostly at the technical management of the ships and isn't looking at those risks that are being introduced from, 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 from elsewhere. So, so something which ensures that the right dialogue is going on before ships um, are, are fixed onto, onto contracts rather than fixing a ship onto the contract. And then what do you know, poor old captain's been put under pressure to, 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 to take it. Um, and the, the, the third one is, the original um, ISM, ISM code was designed around an integrated company, uh, an old fashioned shipping company with everything under one roof. Um, and, you know, Wallums, for example, is a, is a, is a technical manager. Um, and the way that things have evolved, the protections that were built in um, to the, the traditional model 
um, are not there in the in the outsourced model, are not there in the non-integrated model. So you have um, the technical manager quite often at a, at a disadvantage when he's having a dialogue about um, um, about um, costs, a dialogue about taking ships on particular charters and all the rest of that, and he's under some pressure to say yes because the alternative is well, you know, we can get someone else to do this. So those are those are the those are the first three. Thank you for that. We look forward to your write-up for the rest. <laughs> I really dug myself a hole here. Eric, a question for you. Um, the human cost of fish is a powerful concept. Why are the figures on the casualties seem to have huge ranges and not exact or more exact numbers? Excuse me, chuckling away there, Ned. That that's the major problem. You know, we talk about our, our roadmap work being based on evidence. And in the fishing industry, there simply is not the evidence. Very few administrations provide, uh, very few administrations actually collect information about fisher fatalities. Um, with, without naming countries, uh, there are some of the major fishing countries out there that simply don't have a register. And simply when we speak to them, say, Eric, we have no idea. We have no idea how many fishes die. The original figure that, that I quoted, that 80 per 100,000, that 24,000 fatalities from 99, was a ILO project. And all they could do to try and get some idea of the fatalities in, in, uh, in, in the fishing sector was look at the few countries that were providing evidence. And, and those were generally developed world countries and, and Nordic countries. Um, take that figure, wh wh whatever that, that estimation was, <clears throat> and extrapolate that onto the world's fishes. And, and clearly we know, and, and everybody intuitively knows, that in, in certain parts of the world, the fishing uh, fatality rate is, is very much higher. So that 80 per 100,000, that 24,000 figure was fundamentally flawed, not because of, 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 of any fault of the ILO, certainly not, but because they weren't sources, in, sources of information. The fact that we could now get to, to well over 100,000 um, was because we had new technology, and we use unorthodox technology like social media, like um, whistleblowers, like, you know, it, all, all types of things, confidential reporting, all types of things into a database. I think we have 4,000 written pieces of, of, of research, you know, just as, as references along the way. And we're not, we don't think we're finished yet. The, the bottom line is that there simply aren't the systems in place, which is why we, we're introducing the Fisher uh, project. Um, and there's a massive amount of work that needs to be done with administrations around the world to educate, to guide, to assist, to develop formal reporting systems. And at the same time, we have a confidential reporting system, knowing that for a number of reasons, fishers will often not report uh, accidents to the authorities, and there's a whole bunch of reasons which we don't need to go into into that right now. And that's why there's this this massive variation um, in in numbers. Thank you for that. Sticking to the numbers, I've got a follow up question for you, um, probably aligned to to some of what you've mentioned now. Um, it says uh, the thirty percent on engineering because you had those those streams. Mm -hmm. So the thirty percent on engineering seems worryingly low. Why is this, and what is the major road blocker that you see, aside from maybe connectivity? Okay. Excellent. A really good question. And again, uh, you know, just for, for total context, I'm an ex-marine engineer, so the engineering bit and the innovation bit is, is, is really close to my heart. <clears throat> what we do know from the uh, research that we've, that we've done and that we carry on doing is that probably 80% of fishers die because their boat sinks. So think about that figure. Um, the, the primary safe refuge that any seafarer has is the boat that he or she is on. 
So if we're saying 80% of, of, of fishes are, are dying because their boat sinks, that means there's, there's a problem with the boat. So, you know, unlike uh, Martin's maritime industry and my ex-maritime industry, where we have rules and regulations and classification societies and and then every all the different standards in fishing, as I said, for for the bulk of the world's fishes, nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, and with with climate change, I spoke very briefly about some of those those environmental issues. Climate change is forcing the same small boats that might be a dugout canoe to go further out to sea because the fish has moved offshore or because they've been stolen through through illegal, unregulated fishing, IUU fishing, and they have no means of contact, their boat sinks. Um, yeah, just it, it takes us back to that 80% of, of, of fatalities in the fishing industry because the boat sinks. It's as simple as that. So the, the engineering side is massively low, and I suggest it's probably lower than the 30%. Um, okay. But we have to start somewhere. Thank you. May I, add, may I add something to that? Well, you're going to add, and I'm going to give you your <laughs> question, <laughs> and okay, then you can right. add and go into your question. Um, right. The question is, you refer to customers, but do stakeholders in general have power of influencing and progressing the safety culture on time pressures? Right, okay. So, so answering, just, just picking up on what, what um, Eric was saying. Um, there is a great dearth of data um, in, the, in the big ship industry as well. Uh, people are yeah. not reporting stuff. If something sinks, then it generally gets reported. Um, but in, in the enclosed space, what we did, finding information on, on enclosed space deaths, we've had to create the database ourselves. And we've, out, we've actually started naming and shaming um, flags where we see things in newspapers that haven't been reported to, to GCSEs. Um, and by the way, you're not an ex-marine engineer. You're always a marine engineer. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, moving on, and I think this actually that was a very good, it was very, very, very well worded that point because customers and stakeholders. So, um, how, how do you how do you influence the customer? And the answer is it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, because in our in our business, the, com the customer quite often often has a large chunk of power and has his his own desires for running his, his business efficiently. And there is very little in commercial law um, that that deals with the safety of the seafarer um, in in general terms. You can see good practice in the oil industry, for example, where the, the sire system and vetting systems and all the rest of that have pushed for the quality of ships. But you also don't see anything that says, well, we don't want you to rush. So, so it's, it's a difficult one. And I don't know how we get to it because big companies are focusing on, on ESG, which is environment, social and governance. Um, the word safety doesn't actually come in there anyway. You can probably infer it in, in, in social. You can probably infer it in governance. Um, but the box tickers who are only interested in ticking ESG boxes are not sort of getting down to that level. So we are looking at how we can actually do that. One of the things we've got to do is, is, increase, um, is, is increase awareness. And the stakeholder point was very important um, because um, the, stake, the, the biggest stakeholder other than the customer who has, an, who has an effect are ports and terminals. And the ship's legal relationship with the port is, is a complex sort of thing. There may not be any direct um, sort of legal link between the, the ship and, and the port, the, the links may go through the charter and all the rest of that sort of stuff. So what we're trying to do is engage them by, by providing a, we're, we're writing a set of guides at the moment, one that goes to customers, one that goes to, uh, one that goes to the, um, uh, the ports and terminals, other ones that go to the you know, owners and managers. But it's not an easy thing. A lot of the shipping industry's problems are down to the fact that, that there's an awful lot of customer power out there. Um, and that, that um, you know, then commercial law doesn't actually address the, the issues of, of, of safety in, in the context that operations require, the issue in terms of the damage, damage to the ship or damage to the cargo. I don't know if that answers the question. Or not. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Before I wrap up, there's one final question also for Jennifer. Again, thank you for a lovely presentation. What would you suggest 
is the best route for young professionals to get involved and include it in the industry? Great question. And I was in that position not so long ago. Um, I would suggest definitely, first of all, keeping track of what uh, work experience and placements are, are offered and then positioning yourselves, even reaching out to sort of um, people within the company uh, that you're targeting to say like, hey, I'd like to just have an informal chat with someone or um, a lot of, uh, I know Vatafor do a lot of outreach in the communities where we build our projects. So just really talking to uh, people within the company and saying, I'm interested in this area, et cetera. Um, also get a mentor. I love my mentors profoundly um, and they've really helped me sort of position myself on, on how to grow and reach out and connect and with people um, and there are various um, networking uh, organizations within offshore renewables or definitely within the marine industry that you can tap into. I know there's the women in hydropower, there's um, Regen have got one for those in the UK um, and I know Energy UK have got potentially a setting up one as well. Um, what else uh, to do? Um, yeah, just attend as many conferences. I know they've got uh, conferences usually have like student rates, etc. And go up to people after presentations and say, you know, I was really interested in your talk. Can you tell me more about this? It is scary putting yourself out there and reaching out to you know grown up people, professional people. Um, but if you don't push yourself out of your comfort zone you never grow um, um, but know that when you do it is you're welcomed with open arms people love a keen bean um, and yeah definitely do that and finally not that I'm plugging IMRS but I'm totally plugging IMRS um, get involved with your institute I, I've been a member since I was a student um, and I saw a leaflet for IMRS outside my lecture hall and just being part of the corresponding network being part of the committees saying yes to helping out um, really connects you with people within your sector, within your industry, nationally and internationally, and that will help you grow your profile and build your network. It's a bit of a long answer, but... <laughs> Very good it. answer. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, I'm cautious of time. We, we went a little bit over, but I'm sure everybody's okay with it because it's such fascinating discussions we're having. Um, there's a few more questions we couldn't get to, um, obviously, unfortunately, now due to time, but these will be answered separately via email, um, if it's something that we could not answer. Um, my, my last job for the day is in summarizing and wrapping up, but I'm going to probably be able to do it in two sentences, because if we look at, we are all here in the pursuit of the marine sustainability. We had fascinating presentations um, I think, Eric, if I could remember how to pronounce the people, people, people <laughs> in the local dialect, I would do that. My own would be onsa mensa, onsa mensa, onsa mensa. It's about yeah. the people. Um, looking at the, the collaboration, um, from the, whether it's from a, a system approach, and we're looking at getting the research that actually informs education, policy, legislation, um, the funders, where would we be without the funders that don't invest in, in these initiatives and research and development? Um, so that really is for me, I would say the people, 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 collaboration, cognitive diversity, um, the inclusion, um, and of course, as we mentioned, for the younger generation and even the existing more mature generations, we, we currently have probably five generations in the workforce, four generations needing to get, to get the youngers in. So I think that probably sums up what we have discussed today. I would like to thank all of you for your, your time and your, your sharing your, your knowledge and your experience. Thank you so much for that. And also for all online, whether it is morning, afternoon, evening, go get yourself another tea or a coffee or a wine or a beer or a gin or probably your nightcap um, before you go to bed in New Zealand. <laughs> So with that, thank you, everybody. We wish you well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.